What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the after credit scene. We're talking episode five of Secret Invasion. Before we get to all that, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you'll be notified anytime we drop new content and then share this thing all across the multiverse. Uh, got a lot of comments and a lot of probably some hot takes on this episode. First off, uh, the good, then the bad. Uh, I really like this episode as far as the pacing, uh, the information they gave you, the, the setup for the finale. Uh, I really loved a lot of the scenes that they gave you and the things that went on. Very intense, very good drama, very well written. What I did not like uh, was that this episode made the show feel small. Um, all of the other episodes and the choices that they've made and the decisions they've made plot-wise have made the scrolls seem like a global force. They've made it seem like they've been expanding this world, that the people that we knew weren't the people that we knew. And there's things that are going on on a global level and we're just getting a piece of it. And if this piece is bad, how bad is the rest of it? Uh, this episode, they made a lot of decisions that made everything feel small and feel like it was easily resolvable when they spent all this time making it seem like this was the, the, the precipice of World War III. Um, so in terms of plot, I gotta give this episode a C, uh, but in terms of the, uh, the story, I mean, in terms of the, the pacing itself and the action and the dialogue and um, the interactions, it was still A+. Plus. Um, let's get into some of the pieces and, and talk about the episode as a whole. Uh, and then we'll uh, we'll start as we go through the little the small pieces here. We'll we'll talk about the episode as a whole. Um, first off, love the beginning, the recap going right into um, the president being wheeled into the emergency room, uh, and and Fury whispering in the president's ear, "Don't trust Colonel Rhodes." Right before he grabs a chair and sits right in front of uh, the doors to the operating room with a gun. Uh, unholstered, ready to ready to fight, was an epic scene. I thought that was, uh, it, it felt like Nick Fury um, just exasperated, not knowing what to do. This is all I can do. This is what I'm going to do. And it was really, really great. I, I loved that moment. That, that, that wit's end exasperation moment was really, really cool. Um, obviously, you saw some of the newsreels. The news has, has shown that a scroll aided the president um, and, and obviously Gravik is going to try to twist that uh, into something else, but, but it's out there. There are aliens, there are scrolls, uh, people among us, uh, they don't really necessarily know. I mean, it said shape-shifting alien, um, but to what extent and all the other news that the world actually knows, some of that is out there. I'm, I'm hoping that gets twisted into um, there are some scrolls that are good, some scrolls that are, are uh, on our side, but that remains to be seen. Uh, the the uh, slow burn and the drop uh, that Fury had been connecting DNA, the, you know, the title of the episode was The Harvest, um, and that would make you believe that maybe the scrolls are harvesting something, but uh, you soon find out that that means that Fury was harvesting DNA uh, using scrolls, uh, posing as, uh, you know, some kind of cleanup crew after the events of Endgame, uh, collecting samples not only of alien blood and other things, um, but also of the Avengers. Um, to, to have that for either experiments or other tests. There's, there's some aspects of the old Fury uh, who was using uh, Nazi equipment and shield uh, to create weaponry, uh, but that, that Fury is also still kind of the same guy. Um, just wrestling with old Fury, new Fury, all these different things. Um, the, the ramifications of what that could mean are anybody's game, and I thought um, that coupled with uh, Fury being married to a scroll and his affinity for these people uh, was a really great um, pull and a really great reason for why he came back. Um, because he knew where these things were, he knew what Gravik was after, he cared about the people, he cared about Gravik too. Um, and similar to Gravik uh, being confronted by his own people that he couldn't kill Fury when he needed to, uh, and trying to write it off as, well, it was somebody else's fault. Fury's kind of grappling with the same thing. He doesn't really want to kill Gravik either. He has a soft spot for these people, um, and uh, there's this war that he is desperately trying to prevent, and uh, you have to remember, he's known them uh, for 20 plus years, 30 years, and, uh, and, and this is important to him, and so you know, he tells 
uh, Sonia Farnsworth, you know, why do you think I came back? Um, it's because of my family. It's because of, of all these other things. Um, we, we learned the name of the scroll that is impersonating Rhodey. Her name is Rava. Um, and, uh, and we got, uh, you know, some of the, the scenes there between uh, Rava or Rhodey, scroll Rhodey, and Fury. Those scenes were tense and epic. And the, um, just the, the back and forth there uh, really made you hate uh, Rhodey's character and made, made you want Fury to do something, which is probably how he felt too. Likewise, the scenes with Olivia Coleman and her character and her, kind of her, uh, I guess to use that British word, her cheekiness um, were on display uh, and everything that she does in this show is excellent. Um, she, she is an example of someone who is, is you know, Fury's age, maybe a little, obviously a little younger, but, but in her prime as a, a spy, an agent, uh, and Fury, compared to her, feels like he's lost a step. Um, we, we got a second to see uh, Gravik establishing his power uh, and, and all the different things that he did as his people kind of turn on him. Uh, and this was the moment that really bothered me. Um, I really enjoyed that Gravik um, got to show off his powers, that they showed how powerful he was and the things that he was doing. And it really established a little more of his menacing ability. But one, I, I already thought they'd done a lot of that. You know, he, he poses as Fury, he shoots Maria Hill, um, he poses uh, as a soldier and he kills Talos. Uh, there were a lot of things that, that he had already done that felt more menacing than him attacking his own people. Um, and to that end, it seemed to do a disservice to the whole plot as a whole. Up until then, these people were, in, in New Scrollos, were people who uh, were behind Gravik. They appreciated what he was doing. He was fighting for them. He was the general, uh, the newly appointed general over his people. And suddenly you have some of his soldiers who are questioning why he's doing what he's doing, uh, even in the face of him killing one of them for insubordination. They decide, we're going to take him out. Well, and then what? Then what are you going to do? Um, and it went from feeling like this massive global thing where Gravik had all these people at his disposal and he had this intricate network of people that were working with him and, and to a, for a mutual goal of taking over the taking over the world and, and destroying human existence to well Sonya got rid of the the laboratory and got rid of the scientist and and Gravik is being turned on by his own people so not everybody's in Gravik's corner like you once thought which really means it might just be Gravik and a few people um, and so it, it made the story feel smaller. Um, couple that with uh, the end of the story, and we'll get to that in a second, uh, and it made it feel like the solution was equally as small, and I hope that's not the case. Um, anyway, a uh, couple of really cool things moving forward after Gravik takes out quite a few people uh, at his own compound. Uh, you, you get Gravik giving the order to tell uh, Rhodey to encourage the president to bomb New Skrullos, um, to, to use his own people as cannon fodder so that it will look like the Americans bombed Russia and then Russia is going to retaliate and the war will still start. That he doesn't really care how he starts this war. It definitely is, is a little more personal than just him protecting his people, which I thought that element was great, but the way that they're going about it um, felt a little, um, I don't want to say too easy, but it, it felt like a little bit of a letdown. Um, some, some plot holes that they... Uh, that they wound up as as Rhodey, uh, not pardon me, not Rhodey, but Gravik is talking to Fury. Um, he says, uh, "We want to. I want to meet in person. Make sure you bring some iodide pills because the radiation around here won't be good for you." Kind of closes a loophole that hey, the scrolls are aware that humans can't survive in this radiation area, um, which probably means that the humans that they have uh, in the pods that they're holding on to, they they very well could have protected them somehow, um, giving them some kind of injection, giving them. Uh, medication that prevents them from being uh, hurt by the radiation. It assumes that they are aware of that and thereby um, you could assume that they're probably protecting those people. Or you could just assume that they're heartless and they're letting those people be irradiated and they're slowly dying. Either way is uh, a valid response um, and I'll let you choose which version of the scrolls you want to uh, support in terms of that little plot point. Um, uh, as Fury is uh, moving on to, to go and get the vial and 
move on to the next phase of his plan. Uh, we get a cameo from none other than O.T. Fagbenle from, the, from uh, Black Widow. Uh, he made his appearance there as someone uh, with uh, Natasha Romanoff who can get things. Um, one, of those, one of those guys who has ties to the black market and is able to, um, to, to you know, get a Russian helicopter at a moment's notice and get everything that Fury needs. And obviously, if that movie takes place uh, at, a later, at an earlier time frame, sometime in the 90s, uh, and uh, in between Civil War and some of these other movies, then uh, we got a flash forward here with his character to see that he is still uh, very much in the picture and, uh, and active in terms of whatever spy network or thing that he's doing. Um, thought that was really cool to add that character in there and just kind of keep the universe connected in a lot of different ways. Um, the depth that they went to in the character development with the use of Talos's funeral. One, I thought it was a fitting end for Talos um, given that, that he uh, is Ben Mendelsohn's character is no longer uh, alive, but getting to see a scroll funeral and, and, and uh, Gaia not understanding and not knowing how to properly honor him uh, and the other, and the other uh, woman knowing how to actually be able to um, do the funeral and know how to do those rites is Gaia was learning that I don't know everything there is to know about my people either and I'm, I'm displaced and I'm not, maybe not as bright as I thought I was, uh, and she gets to uh, be a part of the funeral and, and uh, get to hear the uh, death rituals um, from maybe for the first time. Uh, it was a really cool addition to her character and to Talos and just to the story in general. I thought it gave it some real personality. Um, after that, uh, as Gravix forces attack uh, Fury and Priscilla's house, we got the Gaia and Priscilla fight we never knew we needed. Um, uh, as they're being overrun, uh, I, I knew Priscilla was going to have some hidden treasure trove of, of equipment and weapons and things like that. Um, but the backpacks and the equipment that they put on, the vests that they put on, uh, and the speed with which they fought around each other in that fight sequence, uh, that shootout was an excellent scene. Um, and just very well put together by the directors and the writers and the coordinators. Uh, all of those things were, were excellent. A very cool scene that I, when it happened, I thought, oh, this is really, really awesome. Um, I thought it was rather funny after that as we see Fury uh, making his way through customs uh, and getting into a car with Sonya, uh, that we see Fury um, masking himself uh, similar to a scroll uh, and putting on a different face. Uh, to get through customs because he is a wanted man. Um, and then we also got a nice, another little, uh, maybe a Black Widow uh, reference or an Easter egg there. For the first time, we find out what those masks are called um, that the widows wear and uh, that uh, at the end of uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier uh, that we see several people wearing, uh, which were, uh, they called it the Widow's Veil, um, that, that mask, nanotech, whatever you wanna call it, uh, mask that they had, uh, they actually gave it a name, and I thought that was really cool. That, you know, finding it out here, you've seen that technology, but it's actually got a name. Um, you get another conversation there about the harvest, uh, where uh, Fury says that we had their blood, and even Carol Danvers spilled her blood. My guess is that they mentioned Danvers by by name, not just because she's a connection to the scrolls from uh, the Captain Marvel movie, but because her blood might be of particular importance to the scrolls. Um, because she is part Kree. Um, and uh, if you remember from the Captain Marvel movie, when she uh, is irradiated with the explosion from the energy from the Tesseract, um, in order to keep her alive, Marvell vell um, uh, in, uh, puts his, or pardon me, Jan Rog, that is his name. That is Jude Law's character's name. Jan Rog uh, injects his blood into her to keep her alive as an infusion. So she has Kree blood inside her as well. Um, and uh, I, I would imagine that maybe that's one of the DNA samples that they want in addition to all the others so they can make any kind of superhuman scroll that they want to. Um, uh, before Fury even said it, and I was glad that he said it, uh, you would notice that the tombstone that Fury goes to uh, to collect the harvest is not actually the same tombstone at the end of uh, Captain America Winter Soldier because the quote on it is a different quote. The quote on this tombstone was, greater love hath no man than someone who would lay down his life for his friends. And the quote on the tombstone at the end of Winter Soldier is uh, uh, also a Bible verse, but it is the path of the righteous man availeth much. And that is actually a quote from Pulp Fiction, which is uh, a deep, uh, 
Samuel L. Jackson cut there. Um, uh, I think it was interesting that the conversation between Fury and Sonya, where Sonya says, you know, why don't you call down some of your special friends? Um, and Fury's explanation, while a little bit convoluted, um, I want to fight this fight on my own, really highlighted his ego. Um, that, you know, we don't need superheroes to protect us forever. We need to fight our own battles. Um, I think was partly his um, mentality since the snap and the blip. Um, I think... Uh, and then the connection between him and his uh, his wife and his connection with the scrolls there was was equally as valid. Of uh, we don't need to blow this thing out of proportion, and and it shows that he cares for Gravik as well. That he um, he he realizes how difficult the situation would be, but he thinks he can handle it. Um, the the part that, that this lead up to Gravik confronting Fury and Fury confronting Gravik, and we've gotten a scene of the two of them fighting. Um, from the, the trailer leading into episode six. I am worried that this is going to wrap up in a small way, that somehow this global worldwide threat of World War III is easily solvable if we just kill Gravik. Um, and I am hoping, because the show has seemed so global up until this point, that taking out Gravik uh, is a last ditch effort that Fury is conflicted about it, um, that if he, that if Gravik does die, that Lord willing, it happens by another scroll's hand and not Fury's hand because that would play right into Gravik's uh, plan, or that um, that killing Gravik is just the beginning of uh, what would become secret wars, and that the scrolls are still out there and they need to go find them and they need to unite them. That you have an ununited group of hidden scrolls all over the world who uh, will make up their own mind who they serve without some kind of leader or council or uh, what have you. And so um, there's still a lot of instability after the events of Endgame. And this is just one other aspect of that, uh, complete with aliens and espionage and all those other kinds of things. Um, again, I thought the, the episode and the action and uh, all those kind of things were an A+, plus, but the some of the plot points were probably a C. Uh, tell me what you guys think. There was plenty of action to go around in this one. Tell me what you think is going to happen in the finale, and we'll include it in our prediction and forecast video that's going to come out in a couple of days. Uh, share those things in the comments. As always, like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell, and then share this thing all across the multiverse. And check out some of our other content. You know we've got a lot of stuff you can sink your teeth into. And as always, when the next one drops, we'll catch you right back here. Later, guys.